Yo, what's happening? Welcome back to the 182 News Podcast. This is your host, Poppin' Curbs, and I really appreciate you making me a part of your day. The last episode was called Catch Up because we needed to catch up on everything in Blink and Angels and Airwaves land, including some of the stuff that To The Stars was up to. Uh, We have just been on such an insane roll of rad interviews that I just wanted to take 45 minutes to shoot the shit and make sure we were all up to speed. Today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest, the tour manager of Angels and Airwaves and Jimmy Eat World, Jeffrey Pereira. I'm super stoked Jeff took the time to hop on, incredibly appreciative of him hopping on and telling his story, sharing some rad insight, fascinating info. It's so dope. I cannot wait for you guys to listen to this. Um, This is going to be a two-parter. I did a poll the other day. I asked the listeners, you know, for those of you who listen to these longer interviews, do you prefer them split into two or do you like these long three, four-hour interviews? The results were kind of funny. It was like 51% of people want them split up. 49 one three and four hour podcast. Uh, I think the threshold to me is about that two hour mark. So this one goes a little bit over. So I am going to split it into two. In part one of this conversation today, we get into his background. You know, some of the bands he's worked with. He's worked with My Chemical Romance in their absolute prime. He's worked with Taking Back Sunday. He's done everything from drum tech to guitar tech, lighting director. So even simple stuff like What does a guitar tech do? What's your day like? Um, What is a typical day for you as a tour manager on an Angels tour? So stuff like that is just fascinating to me to hear that, you know, from somebody who does this for a living, particularly when it's with a band we love. It's just super interesting to me. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, Today, we also talk about some funny stuff like what are Tom's fans like compared to some of the others? You know, the do's and don'ts of a meet and greet, just stuff like that. It's a really rad combo. I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, Part two is going to drop in a couple weeks. In that, we get deep into the last Angels and Airwaves tour. It's super awesome. We talk about you know, the vibe around the tour, Tom's emotional state, stuff like that. But here is part one. I'm going to start it off here, and I appreciate you listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now joining us on the 182 News Podcast, tour manager for Angels and Airwaves and Jimmy Eat World, no big deal, Jeff Pereira. Yeah. Jeff, what's up, dude? What's up, man? How are you? Doing all right, man. I can't, I can't complain too much. I mean, thankfully, my career, I'm able to continue working. So we're going to mm-hmm. get into the music industry uh, full-fledged for sure. So I can't bitch too much, but two or three times a day, I stop and think, what the fuck is going on in the world right now? It is crazy, man. Yeah, it, it's absolutely bonkers. Um, it's and it's <clears throat> it's so disruptive to everyone's life. But there is a lot of people, like you said, that have gotten back to work in our aside from wearing a mask or um, you know small changes to their day. They're they're actually still you know working and making money. But like most of the people I know revolve around music and touring and it's completely different you know oh yeah for uh, sure yeah we we, you know it's just so I I sit around all day trying to find something to do to pass the time and I and I'm actually one of the lucky ones you know working with Tom um he lives five minutes down the road so he keeps me he keeps me busy he keeps Justin his guitar tech busy um especially with the record happening right now so it's like I I feel extremely lucky to be able to do that, but there's other guys I know who are have literally been sitting on their on their butts since um, you know December because yeah. the touring world is the touring world is notoriously slow in January February. It's kind right. of the break, you know. People have a the um, the hangover of the holidays, and uh, March is when things tend to kick off again, and that's you know that's when all of this kicked off oh, <laughs> so yeah yeah everyone's just everyone's just been sitting around you know waiting for some sort of good news 
Right, right. Yeah. So we're, we're going to get into that. But to get started, mm-hmm. man, like I know you've had several jobs. I know you were a guitar tech at one point, I think for Taking Back Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I think you were a drum tech at one point. I know you've worked. I know you've worked with Taking Back Sunday. I think My yep. Chemical Romance. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the other bands you've worked with? So <clears throat> chronological order is probably an easier way to start this. Um, but um, straight out of high school, I worked for a, like a, a nine piece ska band from New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> co- they were called one cool guy. And that was like the first band that gave me any real touring experience. Um, and the tour we went on happened to be with, um, a band called humble beginnings who turned into a band called Midtown or Gabe left and started a band called Midtown. Um, who I toured with quite a bit. That was like my real, like where I kind of, you know, uh, the saying like cut your teeth or whatever. And um, Midtown um, shared management with a band called, uh, with a with Taking Back Sunday. Oh, when cool. Taking Back Sunday started going on. <clears throat> and then Midtown, like I grew up in New Jersey. Those guys were from New Brunswick and that whole New Brunswick scene, which um kind of spawned you know bands like thursday and saves a day and all that such and so out of that scene also came my chem but when, when i started touring my chem wasn't even a band yet you know yeah um they uh but those, those dudes were around so um i started touring with midtown then into taking back sunday and then even with midtown my chem opened a few shows and then with taking back sunday my chem was kind of always around as well um at one point my buddy bob who was a front of house guy for the used when the used and taken back sunday were touring together yeah got the my chemical romance drumming gig so i already knew those guys and that brought me into the my chem world so i then uh from there it just kind of bounced back and forth between my chem and taking back sunday and at that time, I was bouncing back and forth between tour managing and teching. Um, all of these bands exploded at such a high rate that, like, I didn't feel comfortable really tour managing, um, and it, that wouldn't—it just wasn't fun, you know. Yeah. I enjoyed I enjoyed teching. Like, I, I'm a hands-on dude. I still, you know, still build quite a bit of, of stuff, um, and I'll still work on on a guitar or two if it's around, like. Uh, I don't really enjoy it anymore, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, so then that goes from, from my chem, um, into like a weird, uh, point in time where I was like, just ending that and tour managing a couple of other bands and then kind of led into, I guess the TBS, my chem thing even led into how I met Tom and David, you know, like early days, those guys all opened up for Blink. Um, which is how I met Tom. And then when Tom was doing the boxcar thing, TBS did a bunch of boxcar dates. And that's how I met and became friends with David. And David is actually who brought me into the fold with Angels years later. Oh, really? So yeah, so so everything there. Yeah, so I've, I've guitar teched, I've drummed. I've actually even started way back in the day of selling, selling merch. Um, tour managed early on, guitar tech, drum tech. I've basically done it all. I've done lighting with Circa Survive. I was their LD for a while, LD slash tour manager. Um, and uh, it's always been like a challenge. Like I've always accepted it when it came in um, as a challenge. I, it, it's just fun. And I think to be a tour manager, you should have, a, or an effect. I feel like you should have an understanding of everybody's role. So yeah. I've, I've been, everybody on tour, I've legitimately, aside from a bus driver or a truck driver, I have been in their position, you know? Uh, yeah. I, am, I understand what it takes for them to do to do what they do. And not only that, but, you know, the, the hardships of what, what they have to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's basically kind of <laughs> my, yeah. my quick background. Yeah, um, no, and even I want to even go like a tad bit before that. So I mean, like in high oh, school, yeah. I mean, were you in bands? Like, how did you even get into music? Did you know this is what you wanted to do? <laughs> how did that play out? No, not really. In high school, I was friends with um, a bunch of kids that were in bands, and I had a truck. I had like this Chevy Blazer. Uh, it was beat to shit, and my friends would be like, "Hey, 
if you're going to come to the show, can you just like bring our stuff and then we'll get you <laughs> in for free? And I was like, I was like, absolutely. That's cool, man. Cause like yeah. $5 in a can of food at that time was hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how it happened. And then right out of high school, my buddies were going on tour and they was just like assumed that I was going to be going with them. So like, um, I remember we got down to like, uh, I forget the name of the club. It was in Athens, Georgia. And this, um, this we're loading in and this woman walks up and she's like, well, who's your tour manager? And people just kind of looked around <laughs> and they were like, <laughs> I guess it's that guy, you know? Yeah. And, uh, that was kind of the start of my professional life of touring. You know, that was like 90 late, I guess 90, I don't know, 97, 98 around yeah. there. Um, and then came home from that and was like, oh, college is lame. <laughs> like, yeah, it like, is. I, I do not want to do this. And so uh, just kind of took my chance and made it a full-time thing. It wasn't full-time right off the bat, but, um, you know, I had to do some jobs, some odd random jobs when I'd come home from tour for a couple months before, you know, my name really got out there amongst the bands that I worked with. And, yeah. um, but uh I guess, I mean, that's kind of the way it should be done, right? You got to yeah, grind pay your it dues. out for a little while, pay your dues, get in the van and drive around for a long time, Yeah, drive all night long. Yeah, yeah that, that's how that went. Yeah, so cool. what, I, see, uh, I never, so, oh, go ahead. No, you're fine. I was going to ask, like, what goes into, I mean, being a, say, guitar tech? Like, what is your role? I don't know what you all do other than, you know, make sure the guitars are tuned, ready, and I <laughs> assume the sound is all right. But, like, what is that life like? You know, it's, it, it's crazy. And, you know, um, for fans of, of angels and more so maybe like people that go real deep, like Justin, who's Tom's current tech. Jesus, right? Yeah. Jesus. Jesus okay. actually, this was Jesus's, this touring cycle was Jesus's first time ever teching. He's yeah. played guitar, you know, he's played guitar and stuff. And I went through this, like he was David's, like he was one of David's baristas at James coffee. Okay. And David was like, hey, man, can you just talk to this kid? I had met him previously, you know, and Justin's a, an absolute sweetheart of a guy. He's like, we've become really close. Um, he's a sweetheart of a guy. And David was like, just take a chance on it. Like, just have a conversation. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But um, I was like, yeah, absolutely. I, I would literally do anything. Like, if, if David was like, can you take a chance on this dude? I would do it. Like, that's how it worked. David was the one that put a chance out on me to get me yeah. into Angels. So I was like, a absolutely. Um, if David's going to vouch for somebody, I'm going to try it out. And so Justin called me. He was like, all right, man. Yeah. So like, I've been doing all this research and doing all this stuff. <laughs> and he was like, so like, but like, what do I really have to do? And I broke it down to a way that I was taught, which was basically like, the first thing you're going to think about like is um, like how your day starts. So like as a guitar tech, he's responsible. Or, like as soon as he wakes up, you know, he's responsible for loading in. I mean, depending if you're one of the, the guys on tour that sleeps until load in, but like he's <laughs> responsible for, uh, for all that gear from load in to load out, you know, making sure that he's up on time or that you're up on time. You're getting all of that stuff off the, off the bus. And a lot of times these guitar techs are, um, also, you know, sometimes stage manager, they're like the, they're the onstage voice between our camp and the local camp, um, talking about where cases go on the way in, uh, setting the stage up properly, like telling them like, oh, drum risers there, that, that cab goes over there, that cab goes over here. Um, and then from that point, loading it in, setting it up, and then the daily maintenance and routine, like uh, the routine maintenance of all of those guitars and all of the electronics that we tour with. Um, and I was, I'll say that Justin, as far as any guitar tech I've ever worked with, aside from this dude, Brad Clifford, um, is probably, and, and my buddy Robbie that does Jimmy Eat World, is so good at daily maintenance. Those really? guitars, yeah, Tom's guitars get so much love every day, but he's so passionate about it. When I was a guitar tech, I'd be like, I'd change strings. I'd be like, dude, let's go, let's go get coffee. Let's go find something to do. <laughs> and Justin's, you know, Justin's like taking these guitars. He's, you know, just micro analyzing everything. He's like, I think this, I think this fret is just a little bit, a little bit shot or this it's buzzing, <laughs> you know, he just, 
he goes so so deep and then like um you know with with the way that angels operates now is it's all and jimmy world actually um we don't have any live cabinets on stage there's no more there's no more heads there's no more cabs everything's direct to we use um axe effects uh threes by fractal um and you need to be just as good as almost like computer programming as you do as like uh as guitar maintenance and justin's brain works in that way you know like building a new um a new page or a new um a new tone or something like that which i i look at a fractal and i'm like this is going to take me like an hour to get you a dirty tone <laughs> you know he yeah. pops in he's just like he just starts tapping away and and like now that he's been with tom so long he he completely you know they'll they're in the studio now um on guitars and they'll be coming up with the sound in the studio and he's already working on it for the live version of it you know wow um but yeah and then you know then of course he's also in charge of we sound check uh then we've got to strike everything for opening bands and then put getting it back out there uh in time for after the opening band's done he handles changeover um making sure that everything's in tune and everything's to his liking you know and that it you're called the guitar tech but you're also kind of um you, you know you're in everything from his mic stand height to his water placement to um, where his like sour patch kids are sitting on stage, you know, like, <laughs> like he, he, it's just one of those things, you know, that you really need to dive into like the psyche of who you're working for and like what they like and how you can keep them happy um, on stage. So the only thing they have to worry about are those songs. Then it's show time, um, and you pack all up, make sure you wipe everything down and do it again the next day. You know, wow, it's um, it's it's a long day, uh, but. It, it is rewarding, you know, especially after a show that opens, a, a show that goes on, and your artist walks off stage and he hands you the guitar. And sometimes him not saying anything at all is great. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. like, there's no complaint that comes out. You know, if he's not like, oh, that guitar sounds like shit or this is buzzing or that's that. He just hands you a guitar and he walks away and he looks happy. You're like, yeah, fuck, that's a that's a win because you know if he was happy, all the thousand, fifteen hundred kids, two thousand kids leaving, they're happy. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And then you pack up, do it again. <laughs> wow. Did you yeah. when you were teching? Was there anything you like royally fucked up and you oh, just will always uh, remember? Yes, yeah. yeah, so and this is an angels thing. Probably my biggest fuck up of all time, um, <laughs> and it gets brought up to this day. So. Uh, when when I first started, when I first came into the Angels camp, I was actually um, Matt, the old bass player. I was Matt's tech. I um, playback pro and pro uh, programming keys and bass, and it was a pretty big world. It was quite a like quite uh, large compared to what we have these days. You know, we still had live cabs. I think Matt had three keyboards, um, and then he had a live bass rig. And so I I had something like. 14 cases just to myself Whew. and um yeah it was pretty nuts and um programming was new to me like running ableton and so like for for those that don't know like ableton controlled all of like the ambient sounds you hear in the background and a lot of the key sounds uh you're running a midi keyboard that run through ableton and then you hear you know without having to have 18 keyboards out there, you can have 18 different keyboard sounds through one MIDI controller. Um, so that was my first time messing with any of that. And David, of course, was the one that stuck his head out. Like he, <laughs> he was like, yeah, Jeff can do it. So I showed <laughs> up, you know, and I'm like, I showed up to the first rehearsal. I'm like, oh, all right, here we go. And um, Matt Walker, the old bass player, he was so good at, at spending the time and teaching me that stuff. And thankfully, I had actually known Critter and toured with Critter, who set everything oh, wow. up and ran a lot of that stuff originally. Um, when a Tig, Mech, Sunny, and Angels did their their co-headline way back in the day, Critter was actually on that tour running playback. Oh, and wow. I, I had asked that guy so many questions that when it was time for me to sit in that spot, I had, I, I had the basis of a lot of it. Um, so, um, but it was still... So what happened, if, if you guys remember, that it was on the love touring cycle. 
after the band would walk off, there was an automated voice that would come on. And it was this speech that this woman would give, basically about everyone coming together as a whole and that like um, the people of, um, you know, just, just love and unity and all that stuff. But every day it was programmed to be a specific city. So Matt, the, uh, Matt Walker had gone in and recorded every city at the start of the tour. And this was the last show and it was London. So every day I'd have to go into Ableton, go into the hard drive, find the one little file, and I would have to replace the city the night before with today's city. So, and there's an A and a B rig for redundancy. And like, um, I know you had Chris Holmes on and he would, uh, he, he, Chris built one of these rigs as well for Angels uh, and ran it for, for Blank. And so he probably, he probably knows the craziness of this redundancy, but uh, we were in London and the night before was Birmingham and I'm going through the files and I'm like, oh shit, Matt, there's no London. You never recorded London and we needed Pro Tools to do that. So he's like, okay, I'll take it upstairs and I'll do it on my computer in the dressing room. And so uh, he brings it back down and we load it into the, the B rig because we were using the A rig for sound check. So we load it into the B-Rig and, and uh, run it. And we're like, great. So Showtime comes around and we're doing a line check. And they're like, they're asking me for to run those lines. They're like, playback, I run them. They're like, playback one, playback two. So I actually started on playback on the B-Rig. And then I went to the A-Rig and I never went back. So when it comes time <laughs> for the encore, the fucking thing, the lady starts going. And we're, it's a sold out show in London. And she goes, and you, the people of Birmingham, oh the wa- right as the band is walking out on stage, and literally, like Tom turns and gives me this like, uh, <laughs> and I and I like look on the other side of the stage and I sit, I just see David staring at me, and dude, I, I've never felt so bad. Oh, I, I could I, imagine. Like, and it was the end of like a couple of weeks in Europe, and like I felt so awful and so shitty and like to their credit as soon as the show is over no one even brought it up they like laughed <laughs> it off they were like oh whatever you That's know funny. there was a couple of like there was a couple of weird odd boos in the crowd when it happened <laughs> people were like oh um, but like seriously my heart sank and it ruined it just ruined it like uh, it hurt so bad <laughs> that's funny but yeah man. I, I i would say that's that's probably the, the biggest worst because you could fuck up all the time like hand someone something that's slightly out of tune or or the wrong tuning and it's a quick like a lot of the times people can't tell like sorry the, um but yeah that one that one hurt pretty bad <laughs> i bet man that's crazy so transitioning yeah. uh, a bit to tour manager stuff so mm-hmm. you gave us a good rundown of kind of a guitar tech so what is the tour manager's responsibility what is your day like Typically non COVID. So basically, once a tour gets announced um, and the agents have all worked out all of their, all of their like contracts and all that stuff, everything starts coming down to me. And there's, um, if you look at one specific day, there's a specific contract that goes along with it. And then I create, for that tour, I create a tech rider, which just basically is a rundown of how we need the day to operate. Everything from, how we're traveling, what we're traveling with, who's traveling, like all of our requirements, everything that's everything that we're going to need someone to know to get us through the day. And and that goes out to the promoter. And then I create like a separate little advance sheet. And then the promoter rep calls me or I call them or I try to do it all through email. I hate talking on the phone, especially when someone's just reading a like 30 page email back to you. Yeah, yeah dude, this is like this is why it's in an email, just highlight points that you need me to do and I'll get back to you. Um, But um, so then that's, you know, we advance the show and um, that's to start the tour. And then I handle everybody's, I do that for every, if there's 30 shows on the tour, I do that 30 times. And then while I'm doing that, I'm also booking everybody's flights to get out to the tour. I'm booking buses booking vendors like our lighting vendor our audio vendor um and uh, you know a production facility pre-pro like uh rehearsal facility uh getting all that stuff lined up 
But once the tour actually starts, like say the first day of tour, um, I'm still going ahead. I'm still like going, re-advancing shows, talking to promoter reps the day before. And then uh, from that day on, like say on a day that I wake up on a normal show day, uh, I'm probably uh, I wake up a couple hours early try to find good coffee, especially if you're the angels, it's very important to go find like a good coffee shop, good breakfast spot. I bet it's very much like, yeah, if you can, um, if you're like, if you're, if you're a kid that wanted to meet angels, just basically (laughs) when we're in your city, find the best coffee shop. (laughs) And we like, we would most likely end up there before the, the, before load in, you're going to see like 10 or 12 dudes in there trying to get a cup of coffee and some breakfast. Um, but then we're we're loading in, you know. I'm walking the venue, uh, getting everything together, um, talking with the locals, trying to get, you know, making sure everything's there, making sure everything that we advanced is talked about, is 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 the way it should be. Then it's first things first, getting everybody fed. <laughs> so <laughs> we're calling calling in some lunch, having a runner go get lunch. Um, starting to go over the day's schedule and numbers and budgets and making sure everything is on point. Uh, very early on in the day, once we walk in, we do a, I do a walkthrough with our promoter rep, find out where we're going to do a meet and greet, where merch goes, um, what's off limits, what's on limits, uh, dressing rooms, all, all that kind of jazz. It's, um, and then kind of, making sure everyone sticks to their schedule. It's a lot of checking your watch, checking a peek, taking a peek at the stage, making sure you're good, making sure you know where everyone's at. You know, um, for angels, it's a bit different because Tom, Tom will sometimes ride the bus. Other times he'll travel separately. So it's like making sure that he's up, he's on his flight. He's on, his flight is landed. His flight's on time. He's on his way to the venue. Uh, if he's not on the way or if something's delayed, making sure that everybody on stage knows that he's <laughs> going to be delayed. Sound check's going to be delayed. Um, it, there's so much of that. There's so much, ba- not, I don't want to call it babysitting when it's adult male, but there's so much checking in, you know, <laughs> being like, hey, are you good? You good? And like yeah. four band dudes, you're doing that four times every every couple of minutes, every every 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, getting guys ready for sound check then getting them off, making sure that any sort of press obligations are handled, making sure everyone's cool, relaxed, making sure the dressing room is stocked with it, what it needs. Um, and then once again, getting everybody fed for dinner, getting doors open on time, uh, and then making sure lo- like support bands are there, making sure, um, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I, I actually feel like I've been out of it for so long. My last show was December 22nd in Houston. It was wow. the last Angel show on that festival. On the, and um, I'm actually worried about when it comes time to actually do shows again, how out of practice it's going to be. Because from <laughs> what I last heard, it's like it's very far away as away we are from going back to normal shows. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But yeah, then making sure the show making sure the show actually happens you know yeah, yeah. Again, keeping everybody keeping everybody on their schedule and then shows done um my job like i usually settle which is like getting the band paid during the band set so like it's kind of funny as a tour manager you spend all this time working up to like the big payoff of the day of like watching a band play and then you a lot of times don't get to actually see the <laughs> band play like a lot of times I'll, I'll put the band on stage. Uh, I'll go out to front of house, see what it's all about. See it, make sure everything's cool. Um, I'll go to the production office and settle. And then hopefully by that time there's like encore, you know, hopefully I'm done before encore, which usually a lot of times I, I, I am, but sometimes there's an issue and you miss that. Yeah. Then getting the, getting the band off stage, getting Tom out, through, uh, out of the venue into a, into a car to a hotel. Um, if he's not staying on the bus, um, and then him into a hotel and then we start the whole thing over again. Uh, and then of course there's also making sure there's after show food. Food is very important. (laughs) 
Yeah, <laughs> I know. I want to get into the current tour stuff a little bit later because I'm very curious as to like the pre-show routines and, you know, the post meal, pre-meal, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, in regards to your day, at what point do you get to take a, a deep breath and relax or does it ever happen? Um, there, there's odd times normally, like during sound check, I'm like, that's, I'm hands off. You know, I get the band up there. I do my thing. That's actually when I'll start, like what, a what I call like a, a pre-settlement. I'll put all my numbers from the, the that day's budget into my Excel sheet, um, and build my show file for that day. Like my, uh, and that's kind of like, for me, that is a little bit relaxing because it's yeah. literally just data entry. I'm taking numbers from one form, put them into another and I kind of get to zone out a little bit. Um, and then as soon as they walk off stage, you can tell like dudes are like a little bit hungry or dudes are like, they start getting <laughs> restless. Cause like they look at their watch and they realize that like, they've got like five hours till our next commitment. You yeah. know? And so they yeah. start like, they start wondering what they're going to do. And I'm like, Oh, w- w- what do you want to do? And the worst is like when a, like, I, I get crazy anxiety about leaving the venue. Not, not so much with, with angels. Um, I do it a little bit with Jimmy World. I, I get this weird anxiety about leaving once once we've like gotten into the mode of being at a show. You know, once we've loaded in, once we start doing there, I just don't like being away. With Angels, I have um this crazy level of like trust in my team where like everyone on the Angels camp I've toured with numerous years before. Like oh, cool. Ryan Ke- Ryan Kelly, our merch guy, me and him did Midtown together. In two, like in 2001, 2002. Um, wow. I've, I've known that guy for so long that like uh, I, I don't have any questions about, you know, like I, I know I, he can be left alone. And, yeah. Um, and same thing, like the, the Angels camp throughout the throughout, I, I don't really have any questions on. So like I know if I'm leaving, like if Tom wants to go somewhere and I and I have to go with him, um, I can leave those guys up to their own devices and, and they'll be fine. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's a hard like. There's no relaxation when that happens. It's like I just want to be back at the venue, getting things yeah. done, making sure making sure the day goes over. Um, but yeah, sorry, I think I got sidetracked on that one. <laughs> no, that, no, that, no problem at all. So you mentioned that you get involved, you know, with David, and then eventually with Tom. So I yeah. mean, do you remember, like, for one, like, what year was this? Like, Love Era? Is this Angels or what year? Like, was this Blink's so heyday came, or what? I came in to angels in 2011 because i or 2010 ish like love i think with part two maybe i'm not exactly sure which part of the cycle they were on Mm -hmm. um but i came into angels around then and uh and you know came in as a tech and then um but with and i knew because i knew david before that uh i had actually met I'm trying to think of when I originally met Tom. I met Tom in the Blink heyday, but those dudes were never really around. Like on Blink's heyday, those dudes would literally show up at set time, put their ears on, play, and then leave. And that's when like (laughs) Midtown, you know, like they were a little bit around a little more in the Midtown days. But in the um, in the uh, Taking Back Sunday, like it was like Taking Back Sunday, Cypress Hill, and Blink. I feel like I rarely saw them and they, really? they each had their own bus. Yeah. They each had their own, own bus and, um, and their other families were out. They just had so much going on. They were like such a massive band and they were all cool. You know, like when they did show up, they'd be super rad and make sure we were all taken care of. They were, they were really good. Them and their crew were really good at making sure that all of the, um, all of us were like looked after, you know? Yeah. Um, and that was actually definitely something that I always still to this day, remember or try to remember when um when i'm tour managing a headlining act you know i always try to remember that those dudes were were really cool to me and that i've got to yeah. pay that back to other support bands i'm not sure i'm always good at it but i do <laughs> you know i do try to think that uh i do try to remember that just how how good they they made it for us um with Tom, we you know we really didn't get together until the uh, until Angels. That's like when we started to like. Yeah. That's when I really got to know the dude, um, and and go from there. But yeah, that, thankfully, like again for thankfully for for David for bringing me in. 
because I'm like this. I actually think touring with Angels is like the best gig. And touring, I, I tour with the two best bands in the world to tour with. These dudes, uh, like both dudes, and so in both camps are are so fucking cool, man. Yeah. Um, oh, I bet, man. I can only yeah. imagine. Yeah. Uh, it, it's. Bad. Yeah, yeah, dude. So I got brought into the camp, and now, you know, like I, I would say, you know, Tom and David are some of my best friends, and it's less like, um, it's a, it, everyone, everyone's so close, you know. Like even from the top of the camp all the way through the bottom in Angels, it's like that, and it's a it's a rad rad touring experience, and like which is also what makes it so much harder that we don't get to do it for so much longer now, and yeah. that we had to cancel shows in the previously because it's like uh, it is a great time. Yeah. So I mean, was Adam there when you came in? Because that'll give people. A good yeah, time. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, so, yeah. 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 So Adam was there when I first came in. Um, and I, I'd also known Adam from his time in the Offspring when yeah. off, so Offspring did in I think it was 2005. Offspring did Warp Tour, and so and I was with my chem at the time, drum teching, which was like drum teching was not my shit. I only did it because <laughs> my buddy Bob, my buddy Bob wanted me to do it. Um, yeah. But like, and we tuned our drum. They, t- Bob played the weirdest kind of size kit, and. Adam would always have something that he'd always come over while I was setting it up and always have some sort of question or some sort of like, <laughs> like why does he do this? So I'm like, I don't, just ask him, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's um, funny. So I had already, yeah, I had, I had known Adam before, previously to that and then uh, got to know Adam a little bit more. I guess I got to know Adam and Tom a little bit on the TBS Angels gig. You know, when um, when they did that, like, they did a bunch of amphitheaters and stuff together once, uh, summer of 2006. It's weird. It's like, it takes me a second to remember all these dates before they oh, like, actually come back. <laughs> but yeah, that's when I actually met Adam, or that's when I actually got to spend real time with, like, Adam and Tom. But yeah, Adam was around when I first started. Uh, and then I actually remember when it was like, yeah, Adam's not going to do it anymore. Which is funny because Adam was always like, "What do you think that band against me?" You know, and I was just like, <laughs> and we always talked about against me. It was just so funny that he ended up playing for them because, like, both of us were huge fans of that band. Which so it's cool for him that he gets to do that now. Oh yeah, for uh, sure. Yeah, and then I remember when Alon came in. Uh, and that was that was rad too. You know, like, was yeah. like a crazy talented guy. Oh yeah. yeah. So for the listeners who don't know, Adam recorded for Love Two, and then Alon came in and did the drums on the tour cycle. So this is 2011 ish. And then here's the thing I'm curious about. So you're on with Angels and Airwaves, your tech. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden in 2012, they're done touring for what <laughs> ended up being seven years. So what did you yeah, end up yeah, yeah. doing during that time to stay busy? Um, so I kind of, I, I mean, there was a few other things like I, I tour managed, um, brand new for a while. I did like, a, a some Europe stuff with brand new. Um, I did this weird gig for Red Bull looking after their bands on Warp Tour, which was like weird because Red Bull, like Warp Tour was a monster energy tour, but Red Bull <laughs> had just started their record label, you know? So like they wanted to have a presence out on the tour, but like on the second day we had a Red Bull tent and like monster came in. It was like, absolutely not. And so that <laughs> had to get like taken down. And so I was still out there kind of just looking after these weird bands. It was like an odd bit of odds and ends. You know, I did this little pop acoustic or, or like a um, ukulele kid called never shout never. Um, I did a bunch of weird odds and ends and then settled, settled down with um, Circa survive for a couple of years. Um, which was a great experience. Like, uh, you know, I, I, Anthony's one of the best front men around, I think. Um, and then uh, that ended and I was kind of done. Like I was kind of done really? touring for a little while. I was, I was really burnt out. Yeah. I was like, I was really heavily burnt out. Um, and uh, I had, kind of I didn't even tell my girlfriend I was like I, I think I'm done like I, I don't really know if I want to do this anymore I don't know how much longer I can tour anymore and I had a list of like three bands in my head that I would tour with you know and after like a couple months of sitting at home um I get a text message and it's like hey what's your schedule like and um it was Zach from Jimmy World and I was like huh, that's weird, because they were on my list. <laughs> like, <laughs> nice. I was like, 
And I just literally respond to it wide open. And um, <laughs> he's like, cool, you're going to get a call from management. So management called and we started talking. And it, it was weird because I'd actually, I'd actually gotten denied the Jimmy Eat World gig previously to like a friend of mine. She had won out. She had, she had gotten it. I had like interviewed and, and talked to management and everything and never heard back from him. And then she shoots me a text and she's like, oh my God, guess who I, guess what job I just got. And I was like, it's going to be Jimmy World. Oh, <laughs> like, fuck, which, of course. Which totally, totally cool. I was happy with her. I was, I was, I was very happy for her. And <laughs> I was still doing Circa at the time. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it was, it was all good. And then um, it just happened to come back around. Uh, and so I started kind of just started touring again and realized that I, I still do love it. You know, I, I, like uh, I wish everybody could do it. I wish everybody could at least spend a summer or like uh, just some time getting to like travel the world with their friends and like and make people happy. Not just make like the artists you work for happy, but like it's so rewarding to like stand at the door and watch people leave a great show and know wow. that you had a part of that. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's the cool, it's the coolest feeling, man. And like, I miss that a lot right now. Um, and like, it's, it's cool on both sides. Like, like you get to, um, you get to tell an artist or you, you get to help an artist like create their vision. And when that goes off without a hitch, and the artists walk off stage and they're pumped and then kids are leaving the venue and they're pumped. You're like, hey, 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 like, I don't, I don't understand where else I would get that level of fulfillment from doing my job. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, or doing a job. Like I, I, I'll like, like what I, I don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know how to explain it. Like I'll, I'll make somebody something like, um, like when I, while I'm home, I'll like, I'll fabricate stuff for people in my small little shop and like, they're paying you to do it and you give it to them and they're like, Oh yeah, cool. Thanks. You know, like, oh, <laughs> okay. man, this, just, this just doesn't have the same feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the touring thing is just so it's like, I wish everyone could understand that feeling, you know, like it, it, it is so rewarding. Um, and so like, it, it, I don't even know. I, it, it's just like, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So that's clearly, like, so I that's gotta I be, I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, that's got to be your favorite part of touring, right? Oh, it sounds yeah. like it. I mean, absolutely. Aside from getting to spend like quality time with really good friends, you know, yeah. um, like, and I look at both camps like that, you know, like with Angels, I'm lucky enough to like have have the people around. Like Angels is weird because I've got younger dudes that like I feel look look to me for answers you know um and not even just like touring stuff but just like life answers you know like i've got like our our drum tech is one, a, another one of my best friends this guy jake um he I, we actually met he was tour managing touche amore on, on the circus survive run and i love the dude from the get-go i was like fuck this dude's got he's just one of those dudes like he's got a great personality and he's like six five so he fits in perfectly with the taking back or with the with the angels <laughs> camp since everyone's because everyone's but Matt is so tall. It fits they are, man. Um, it's weird to be this, like, I'm one of the shorter dudes. I think it's just, I think it's me, Alon, me, uh, Ryan, Kelly, our merch guy, Alon, and Matt. Like, <laughs> Matt's, no offense to Matt, I love that dude to death, but he's, you know, he's on his own end of the spectrum. But, like, yes. it's weird when, like, I walk into a room and I'm looking up at everybody. I'm like, fuck, man, this is, <laughs> this is odd, you know? I'm 5'11". Yeah. Know? You're taller than uh, me. Yeah, there you go. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, it's like getting getting to travel with those dudes is, is great, you know? Like like I've got a, a phenomenal set of dudes that look up to me and then I get to tour with dudes that I've always looked up to who who have always been willing and kind enough to lend me uh an ear, you know, outside of touring life, you know? And so you get to go out and, on tour and not just have like shitty conversations about where to eat and like stupid, like dick jokes, even though there's plenty of those, but like you get to go out there and get real life knowledge from, from guys that have already experienced it and lived it and, and like, and just grow as, as a person. So yeah. like, imagine, imagine getting to live every day like that, where like you get to spend all this time around dudes, um, individuals that, uh, are willing to share so much knowledge and 
and like look after you. But on top of that, you get to do this crazy performance that everyone gets stoked about. Yeah, so man. It's like, why would you not miss that? Or how could you not miss that? Or how could you not um, appreciate that? And, you know, there's a point in time in my life where I was too young and stupid, like with my chem to really ever fully appreciate that stuff. You know, that shit came, that, that stuff came so easily during like revenge and black parade for me, not necessarily for the band, you know, they had their own things, but like, I was just a, a friend that could fix instruments and tech and knew how to like set up yeah. a stage. And so I got, I got taken along, but, but I was like, Oh, this is easy. Like we're at the top of the world. This happened in a flash and this is easy. And like, you know, you get bored of traveling the world and sitting in hotel rooms and it's up to you to make, um, to make your own adventures, you know, like, yeah, I remember we do, this is crazy, but we went to Brazil and we all had these, I built everybody these Pelicans, uh, pel, you know, road case, like Pelican road cases, you know? Yeah. So I built everyone that had like, when you flipped it open, there was a computer monitor and then an Xbox. And we like <laughs> literally flew to Brazil and just all we did was go into a hotel room and play Halo instead of like going down to the beach or doing, you know what I mean? <laughs> or just like, and that was what I spent my youth of touring doing. And nowadays, as I'm older, it's like learned the right way to do it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, go out and go out and see the world, go out and see all these cities. And I just I'm able to like really um, just really like appreciate that way more. And especially now that, you know, we're not allowed to tour and we won't be allowed to tour for a long time. Just like yeah. kind of kind of really look back on that stuff. Which uh, which Halo, by the way, I'm curious because I was such a gamer back in the day and it was just nothing but Halo. My whole fucking college experience was basically just like smoking weed and being really good at Halo. <laughs> Do you remember? Um, so it was the summer of Project Revolution with Linkin Park and Mike Hem. Do you remember? Yeah. What, I think that's 2007, maybe. Yeah, it was like 2006 or 2007 because they were supposed to play in my city, which is rare for a cool show to be in my little town in Indiana. And Chester, of all people, was sick and they had to cancel that show. And what's crazy, I'm actually in the process of moving and I just found a poster I have signed and it's signed by all of Linkin Park except Chester. Oh, no way. Yeah. No way. That's that's. I feel like I vaguely remember that. It's crazy, um, man. I think I think it was I think I think it was 2007 because I think 2006 was TBS and Angels Summer. Okay. Um, so I think it was 2007, and um, but Xbox or Xbox was a, a main sponsor. So whatever year Halo that would be was when we were playing it like crazy. It would have been Halo 2 um, or Halo 3. Halo 3 dropped. I want to yeah. I, I say Halo 3. Do um, uh, The Pit, Guardian, Construct, any of those maps ring a bell? That, that's Halo 3. Okay, yeah. yeah it's Halo Damn, 3. You were, a, you were a gamer nerd. <laughs> Dude, I, I'm not to brag, but I was like top, I think, 600 in the world at one point. That was my no claim, claim to fame. Yeah, I'll fuck somebody up on, on Halo 3 for sure. But uh, yeah, anyway, so on the flip side of, you know, how awesome tour is and, you know, and I've noticed this as well in the downtime, like there is nothing to me that replicates the feeling I get with live music. Like there's nothing in the world that is as cool as being in a room vibing with your favorite musicians, your favorite music. It's just so fucking cool. But the flip yeah. side of that is, you know, as amazing as that is for you and for the artists, it, it has to be. I always think, you know, God, touring has to be such a fucking grind. I mean, nonstop grind, especially if you're sleeping in a bus. What is the thing you dislike the most about touring? Um, it's weird because right now I'm so I miss it so much that I don't even think I could think of something that um, comes <laughs> you're up down with. to sleep on the I tour. Mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if someone told me to get in a van right now and that you like you wouldn't get sick, just get in a van with your friends and go somewhere. I'd be like, absolutely. Um, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, the travel is hard and the older you get, like I feel it, it does. It takes longer to acclimate to get to sleeping on a bus. But like your other options are to wake up and fly every morning. So, you know, it's like on a bus you get sometimes you don't get the best sleep. You're bouncing around. There's not enough space. There's people, people are up and doing their thing. Um, 
and like they're, they're, it's like six of one, half a dozen of the other. What's what's going to be the worst for your amount of sleep? You know, and yeah. sometimes you get a great drive. Sometimes you get a great bus driver, and you're like, oh, I sleep perfectly on this bus. <laughs> you know, um, and then sometimes you get a bus driver. You're like, what are you doing up there? You know, yeah. he's just like he's like Mario Andretti, just ripping every corner possible. Um, uh, but actually, the last Angels run, we had this dude, Dave, by any chance he's listening, he was so good, man. This dude, he, he like, I slept like a baby on that bus. And the, the first Angels run, um, the dude that we had, neither Tom nor I slept a wink. Oh, God. It's funny, the first, with the first Angels run, um, there's, we had two buses. Um, it was Tom and I and the family on, on the one bus, and then everybody else was on the second bus. Like, um and i it, like neither one of us ever slept it was wow. absolutely ridiculous so the second run he was like i'm just gonna fly everywhere and i was like cool <laughs> uh and then we get this we get this other bus driver who drives like a he drives like a saint and i slept so good every night and then tom was like flying every day he's just like i'm still not sleeping and i was like i felt so bad for the dude like, oh god it's not it's not easy and then you, you know you look at someone like tom who you know he's with like getting sick you know like imagine you're it's december and you're flying every single day you know and you have you're singing every single day like that is hard man oh yeah uh, and sure enough it, it caught up to him and like you know there's we, we ended up having a short we ended up having to shorten the set a little bit you know it, it was it gets really hard i would say the travel inconsistent travel is the hardest part of touring yeah you know I figured but it like, has to be. you wake up yeah you know you wake up and you just you get about your day you got a job to do and it's easy when you got good people around you it's also really hard when you're on a tour that you definitely yeah definitely don't feel comfortable with you know or you're not really that 100 percent stoked on because that happens you know yeah. there are tours where like sometimes you're just not around the coolest dudes, you know, you're, you're just, and it's not, or it's not that they're not cool dudes. It's just that you, they're just not, you know, you don't vibe with them. They're, they're not yeah. who you are, you know? Oh, yeah. um, and like, like I said, I, I you know, I, I think I work for the two best camps in the world with, with Jimmy and angels and like everyone from management on down. I, I like, I, you couldn't be happier with both camps. Um, and uh, so that, that makes it a lot easier, but, you know, travel, travel's worth early bus call or early lobby calls to catch early flights. Probably the worst part about touring, you know, because oh, we don't I get done until, we don't get, we don't get done until 12 or one. And then they're like, all right. Uh, and I'm the one that has to set their lobby calls, but it's like, <laughs> all right, lobby call is going to be 4:30 AM. Like, no, um, that's brutal. That's the worst. But, uh, I would say, you know, the positives, Positives definitely outweigh the negatives, um, but you have to take your own personal mindset and make things positive. You know? Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. I mean, that's funny about the bus driver. That's something I would have never thought of, but it's clearly Dude, very important. They have so much power. It is, un <laughs> it, 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 is, it is crazy how much power they have. You can, like, if there's a bad bus driver, He'll put everybody in a bad mood. He'll put, you know, and like we had a really bad one with Jimmy World last summer, like two summers ago. Um, when Jimmy World did the Third Eye Blind tour. Um, okay. That fucking, like, our band bus driver was phenomenal. That dude was great. Then we had this dude, Steve, that drove the crew bus. That was, he was the biggest dork. <laughs> like, he would get into fights about, he would like, he, he, I think he, he would get mad at the crew for like, he'd be like, you drank my Dr. Pepper. Oh gosh. Like, Dude, we get 24 Dr. Peppers a day. Make <laughs> it happen or go buy your own Dr. Pepper. You can stop at any guy, you know? And I think he would honestly drive like a dickhead on purpose. Oh, and the my. guys would wake up, the crew would wake up and they'd be like, dude, we got to do something. Um, and it's so hard to replace a bus driver in the middle of the summer. Like every tour is uh. out every, you know, and like, and there's shortages on drivers and like the company was just, they were trying, they were trying to get it. But like, I literally fired the dude with like over a week left and they couldn't get me a replacement. 
Oh so my gosh. Really, it made for a really last odd week, him knowing that I couldn't deal with him anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it, like it sucks because it's like, I never want to do that, man. I want everyone to make their money. I want, you know, like, yeah. but he had, you know, sometimes he's, this guy, he was just burnt out. He was going tour to tour to tour to tour like, just to make, make his money. It's just like, you got to know when you need to step away for a little bit before you get burnt <laughs> out and start affecting other people. I've, I've made that mistake. You're he's like, you definitely made that mistake. That's crazy, man. I didn't realize it would, it would get to that point. Yeah. It's like, go drive kids to summer camp or something. <laughs> Leave us alone. Exactly. Just That's go funny. home. Just go home and take do a project for a couple weeks, you know? <laughs> Just reset. Make yourself like bus drivers are the craziest part about touring, man. I had a bus driver taken back Sunday named T Bone, who was like, he picked us up. He was like, Hey, you mind if my lady rides with us for the first for the first couple of days? And I was like, mm, this is odd. But I was like young in my tour managing days. So I was like, this is odd, but I'm gonna play it cool. So yes, dude, she stayed with us the whole tour. Oh, we my had a bus God. driver and his wife. And she and it was weird because they like they both always wore like beer promo merch. Like they'd always have been being like matching like matching Corona shirts like that they got from like a beer promo. Yeah. Then she stole somebody's weed out of their bunk. Oh like, my god! This should be a TV series like Crazy Tour dude, Bus dude. Drivers. Bus drivers are the war. I'm sure if you I'm I don't like I don't like uh. I'm sure there's probably a, a group on Facebook or something like that of like crazy tour bus stories or crazy bus driver stories. Man, I'm going to start bringing these out because this is pretty crazy. So, yeah, that that's nuts, man. So anyways, Elon and Tom, so they go yeah. on to make the Dreamwalkers. So there's no tour for Dreamwalker. Are you around at this nope. time? This is OK. Yeah, so I've, then I mean, I've always, always been around. I've been with since I started working with Angels, I've been living in carlsbad or san diego or like or lucadia encinitas i've i've been in this area so since around that time um i even lived at like the studio in between tours for a little while the old studio at rlp yeah. i would just stay there because there was like a living it was like a full area to live in and i would come home from tour and i'd be home for like 10 days and i'd be like it's no use for me getting a place yeah so i would just stay there um and uh so i've been around the whole time and uh, yeah, they did Dreamwalker, and it was weird because like I'd I'd be asleep, and then all of a sudden Aaron would fire up the studio, and I would just hear him mixing Tom's, you know, like <laughs> mixing Tom's line, like just over and over and over and over. I would hear lines from the Dreamwalker um, while he was doing that. Is this a Jupiter Sound or whatever uh, he called his yeah, little studio? I, I don't. You know, it was weird. Like we just referred to it as RLP, which was like the the company at the time was. Um, that's what the building said. That's how I, I was just called it, either the studio or RLB or something okay. like that. Um, but I believe I, I seen Jupiter Sound. I saw the name No Pants Ranch. I saw. <laughs> yeah, I saw a few different names, but um, that place was that place was cool. And it's weird. Um, my buddy, my buddy works for like a startup Instagram company that does like odd chiropractic body movement videos it's real weird they sell like this program but they now own they now work out of that space oh that's funny gosh yeah, so he yeah it's really odd like they, they moved out of there 2014 or something like that so going back there is so strange like all the memories like the stage is still in there wow the, the control room still looks the same tom's office still looks the same the, that's crazy the space up above is the same I was like, I don't like this. Like, people, I'm out of here. Just, people make like voyages throughout, you know, San Diego and LA to go across like sombreros and like Tom's high school and shit like that. Now they're going to start popping into this chiropractic yeah. place to so, get a peep at the studio. You know, we, we used to have the big metal letters back in the, in the, behind the building, the big ABA yeah. letters. And when I was living there, like at the time I only had a motorcycle and I'd be coming home late at night back to the studio and I'd come around the corner and there'd be kids there taking their photo, scare the shit out of me. It'd be like <laughs> one in the morning, there'd be like a bunch of kids hanging out, taking a photo or like, or like, or I'd be watching TV in the control room and like, I'd hear something and I'd hear like whispering and I'd look out and you'd see kids like scampering. Oh away. gosh, that's like, funny. Oh, this is fucking weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that is. I was, uh, we had a weird one. One day we were, it was really hot. So we had the... The control room had these all glass um, 
these glass windows, but there was ivy that had grown on security bars, you know? And, mm -hmm. and one day we had, we had opened the door, which it was still like a locked off area. You couldn't get in, but we had opened up the door and I'm sitting on the couch. Tom's, I think maybe even, I think he was like standing up, maybe recording vocals or something. Aaron's sitting at the, the desk and out of the corner of my eye, because the door was open and the reflection, I see like a girl like, oh my out, God, like, like trying to peek through the ivy. And it's like, it was the creepiest thing. I had to run around outside, and I, I was like, I was like, hey! And she, and she was so like, she was, she was so scared. And I was like, you can't do that. You can't do that. You have to leave. And like, her mom was sitting in the car outside. Like, her mom drove her. Like, I don't know who what mom thinks that's okay. Like, yeah, uh, get on those dudes. Yeah, yeah. Get, as get as close this, as you can to that weird ivy. This ties into one of my questions. I might as well bring it up now. So, how crazy are Tom's fans? compared to some of the other band members you've managed and worked with because they can you get know, Tom's, crazy. yeah they're i mean they're not pretty bad they're they're okay i mean you have you know you got to remember like my chem was the heyday you oh, know yeah. like we would go to chile or south america and there'd be three thousand kids at the hotel you sure. know like and poor gerard man that dude couldn't go anywhere without some kids screaming, you saved my life at him. Like putting that pressure on that dude wow. constantly, you know, like that was an odd time. Um, he always handled it like really well, like very like graceful and like stuff. But like um, they had a bunch of weird fans. Jimmy World has the most gracious fans. They're like the most grown up regular people that are just like, Hey, can you sign this weird like jejun split that you did in '97? <laughs> and, like you're like, yeah, cool. And my like, guy's like, all right, cool, see ya. You know what I mean? like, <laughs> so polite. Just, like they're so yeah, they're so polite and they're so just like normal dudes that just want to get something signed. Um, Tom's <laughs> fans, they get like they're cool. It's so rare that you get like an overzealous one. You know, yeah. sometimes you guys you get dudes that get like really hyped. You know, and like really like animated, and you're like. Whoa. <laughs> but um, for the most part, they're 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 pretty low key, you know. Yeah. Um, but he's he's like <clears throat> Tom's like the Flash man. That dude moves in and out so quick. Like he comes to the venue, it's like right in the back door. Yeah, it's so hard to catch him. But like I've seen people catch him like on the street, and he's super chill, you know. Yeah. Um, he's super cool about it. But um, I would say Mike Kim probably had the craziest fans. Really? Um, yeah, I've heard, like. Uh, you know who had uh, when I did that Never Shout Never Kid, he had some weird fans. We had this, we'd have like girls in the dressing room somehow. When we got back, they they'd be standing there. Like I remember one day at like a House of Blues, I like everyone walked in, and when I closed the door, she was hiding behind the door, and she was like, ah! and, like "Oh my god!" I was like, "What makes you think this is okay?" Yeah. You know, it's really um, weird. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, been, I've been super lucky. I don't do any of like that weird, like the eccentric, like pop level, you know, yeah. kids like that. Right, like, right. I get like kids. I mean, my chem at that time was a pop band, basically, like just in the terms of popular music. But um, yeah, I, you know, thankfully, pretty lucky that like the older we get, the more their fans are, the more like the fans have subdued themselves. Like, yeah, a little bit. I mean, yeah. can, I mean, can Tom can Tom go out to eat at a normal place, walk through an airport relatively unbothered? Relatively easy. It's pretty funny. Like, so we started. Um, our buddy Peter is like shooting this documentary. Like, it's yeah. kind of been like, yeah. yeah, he's been. And so one of the first days he had come down to like hang out in San Diego. He had been down a few times. Him and David are really, really close. And um, he does a bunch of stuff with James Coffey. And then, like, when the whispers of this angel thing started, to, angels thing started to happen again, Peter was like, yo, I want to be involved. And we were like, of course, why would you? Oh, yeah. Like, he makes really great stuff, you know? And, like, he's a fan. And, like, he's a genuinely great dude and a genuinely, a genuine fan. And so um, he started coming around and, like, we were doing a lot of, like, just filming and stuff. And um, the day that, we announced or the day that the belly up show, which was going to be the first angel show in however long, um, the day that the belly up show went on sale, we went and got coffee. It was me, Tom, uh, Peter and his buddy and, uh, and the other guy that's shooting this guy, Max. Um, 
and we go to this place in Solana Beach, which is right across the street from the belly up. And like, I didn't even, none of us even thought about it. Like, oh shit, 10 o'clock, the tickets go on sale at the belly oh, up. Oh fuck. And like, we're, we're sitting there <laughs> drinking coffee. But like, um, so we're sitting there and we're like around the back and like, you can almost see when someone recognizes Tom, like you can be like, I bet. Oh, you know what I mean? It, it, it kind of happens, but we're sit down and I see it happen. But out of this kid's mouth, he goes, oh shit. Peter McKinnon. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> like, yeah. And Tom's like, huh? <laughs> What's happening here? Yeah. And Peter's like, hey. And we're just like still filming. It was really funny. But um, but yeah, like that kind of shit happens. But yeah, he, he, I mean, like he can stay relatively anonymous, you know, aside from the fact that he's 6'4", you yeah. know? Um. And he's pretty low key. He, like just wear low, like wears his hat low and like walks around. It's not like he, he doesn't dress like um, doesn't dress like Lenny Kravitz or something. It's not right, like right. He's just you know he's a normal dude driving a pickup truck. Yeah, it's just yeah. like he gets out. You're just like, oh maybe that dude was a basketball player or something. You don't think? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, that's funny, man. Uh, what are yeah. the the worst type of fans? Is it just the overzealous ones who just can't handle themselves or? It's not even the overzealous. It's just like the ones that just can't, the ones that just push boundaries, you know? Yeah. It's just like, like we are, I mean, I know artists are grateful for it, but I'm super grateful for it. That stuff pays my bills. You know what I mean? Like right. you, if you buy like, um, you know, you buy a ticket to a show, like you, you have to understand just how many people you're supporting. You're not just supporting that dude on stage or the dudes on stage. Like there's like a countless amount of crew guys, you know, yeah. there's countless, like there's so much shit that that ticket, <laughs> that tickle trickles down to, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like we're cool with it. And like, and I want to make sure that you're cool with it and like that your experience is good. But then sometimes this is like, the boundaries that they try to push, like, yo, that ticket doesn't include you standing outside the bus screaming, trying to get something signed. Like if it happens, it happens. That's cool. You yeah. know? But sometimes like, like an artist has like, there's a lot of things that need to get done during the day. And if like, there's 20 people out there and like stopping and signing one dude's stuff and telling everyone else to like, basically fuck off feels kind of shitty so it's just like yo we're gonna hightail it in hightail it out like right. if you have the time to do it then great you know and then people get so people get really offended by it and you're like yo we're not it's like someone's not stopping to talk to you because they don't like you it's yeah. because there's a lot going on and sometimes someone needs to call you know and i'm not saying one guy in particular but like someone needs to call their wife because their kid is acting up you know Right. Or like they, they have a whole other life when they're not on stage, like they're devoting the, the, the hour sound check, the 90 minute of the set time or the time getting ready. They're devoting that time to their craft. The other time they still have a regular ass life to live, you know? Like, right. Right. And I understand that like, it may mean a lot to you, but like, you have to understand that like, sometimes they've got just so much else going on that like, why you think it's like a two second thing for them to stop and sign it. it always turns into something longer like i've never seen like like if there's like a one dude out there like hey sign this and it's just like quick you know like or take a quick photo like that that happens all the time and like the one time it doesn't you know yeah. or someone's like yo what the fuck man i paid fucking 50 dollars for this show it's like <laughs> yeah you did but like you got to see the show right right That's right what's included you know I'm like i mean of course and then there is like the meet and greet things and like, and stuff like that, like that we try to do. And those are a fucking sometimes a nightmare of their own, you know, like, um, I bet. you know, and like that, those things, th those things are unfortunate because we're trying to promise people as much as we can, but sometimes it's always like, it, it's not always the same. Hold on one second. Yep. I just had to throw some ice out the, uh, ice out the door, you know, like <clears throat> we're trying to give you everything we can. And like, whether it's a signed poster, you get to meet the band, you need to get uh, take, take a quick photo. Um, and like, we're still learning on that. You know, that was like the real first time Angels had done one in that that instance, you know, like that, that yeah. specifically. And um, and that's like another part of my gig is like, we, we weren't able to tour with a dedicated, like, um, 
meet and greet person. Like Circus Survive, we had a meet and greet person. Like, and that's all she did was handle the meet and greet, you know? Right. Um, like she actually tour manages them now. Like she she did so good, you know, like that that was her entry in. Now she, that's what she does. She's also now a tour manager. Um, but we didn't get to do that with Angels. We didn't, like, didn't have the space to take one with us. And so it was just another thing that fell on my plate, which is fine. But like, that just means that I got to be there to watch people when you're like, like, <laughs> you know, like we have 30 minutes to get photos for 50 people, right. you know, and then get doors open, get everything taken down, get everything. And so like, sometimes we had more time, sometimes we had less time. And like, sometimes you couldn't get things signed. Sometimes you could. And, and that just kind of became like a, a hard point for some people, but, um, you know, like, if you, you know, some people always find a way, man, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's... They find a way to get there. But, um, it's, it was just, it's, it's that kind of stuff, you know, like we, we try, we try to do it. We try to accommodate everyone, but, um, it's just, sometimes that doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes you have protocols that you need to, um, a venue has a protocol that you need to abide by or, you know, or a time frame yeah. that you need to get doors, you need to get doors open on time because that venue wants to start selling booze. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I know. And I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but it's like, you know, really, these people don't owe any of us shit. And I know that's blunt. Yeah. And some people take that the wrong way. And it does. <clears throat> I, I mean, I'll never forget, like, one time I was at a, a Pacers game and I was the only person in the entire arena wearing a Larry Bird jersey because I know where Larry Bird <laughs> sits. And during a timeout, I walk over there to him and I said, Mr. Bird, will you sign my jersey, please? And he looked down at me and said, no. <laughs> and so I'll never, I mean, I sympathize with people who feel that way because it does suck, but you can't take it personally because it's one of those yeah. things. Like if he was going to sign mine, then 75 fucking people during the next time out are going to come down there. And, and I've, yeah. I've assisted with multiple meet and greets and introducing people to their favorite athletes, uh, big time athletes. And it's awesome because you get to help that person, you know, meet somebody that they've idolized for whatever reason. Exactly. It's extremely gratifying, but you're right. As soon as you do one thing, it turns into two things. Like, can I, oh, can I get this on? Oh, can you sign this for my uncle? Oh, can we yeah. get a selfie? Oh, can we get this? Oh, here's five things I made you <laughs> from a long time ago. So it does get you know out what, pretty quickly. And a lot of the time, when it happens in like public, it gets weird because you end up, like say that person does know you, but all of a sudden there's a weird commotion. You start getting people that want to get their photo or something signed that don't even know who you are. Yeah. But they just want to get it. They just want to to get in on it. Like like they're missing out, and then that's when it right. gets really awkward. You know, like, yeah. Ugh. I know, and I always but, hate um, bothering people. Like I would much rather just fucking pay for like a dedicated like autograph line or something like that because yeah. I don't like bothering these people either, man. It sucks, and I'm sure it. I'm sure it gets old at some point. And I think, you know, Tom's had to deal with it more than the others, but surely like David and Alon and Matt, I mean, they can go out to eat and be relatively left alone. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but it's also, yeah, th th absolutely. They can relative, relatively, um, but like the mean green thing just gets so weird. because it's like, you know, you get your chance to meet, like, I don't even know who I would do this for, but like, you know, a lot of the times these like, and it, I guess it's it's kind of weird because like Blink was a lot for me. Like I grew up in New Jersey, you know, and like Dude Ranch was, you know, like when that record came out, I, I was like, that that record meant like a lot, you know. Yeah. Like the the lyrics in that record, like stuff like that, like and then everything up to even the self title, like I still really looked up to it. And like growing with those records and since i did that i know that other people did that like someone like you or like oh yeah there's a people that like those those records were there for them in really hard times you know like in confusing times and the cool thing about like tom and blink and and like in boxcar and angels and stuff is like that they were they were going through those hard those confusing times as well and writing about it so it's like it's so relative and you get to meet that person that whose records have taken you through and, um, and helped you and you get to meet that person and you want to tell them that, right? Yeah. Uh, that's usually a long winded story. <laughs> yeah. So like when you're trying to do 45 people in 15 minutes, you're like, yeah. I don't want to interrupt that. 
I don't want to say, Hey man, we got to get you to keep moving. I you know. know what I mean? Yeah. But like, it sucks because like, then you just all of a sudden see David, uh, Alon and Matt just start having their own conversation. Cause like the conversation <laughs> pretty much. And you're like, usually oh, with Tom. Fucking, yeah. So it's usually just with Tom. Um, and you're like, all right, well, this is kind of, this is kind of weird. And then I've got to step in and go, all right, man, we gotta, we gotta keep right, this buddy. moving. You're like, and you're like, but it sucks. You're like, I don't want to ruin that guy's day like that or that girl's day, whoever. But like, you know, like that, that's an important thing for them. So like, it's kind of weird, you know, like the meet and greet things are cool, but um, I always feel like the chance encounter is so much cooler, you know? Oh yeah. And, like, oh, I agree. And actually getting just like the one-on-one five minute like conversation on the street, like when he's walking back from the movies or something is, is so much more meaningful. And I just, like, I don't know. It's just an, it's an odd position to be in to be that guy that has to go. All right, man, time's up. You got to go. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep. Seriously, no. I yeah, I can totally understand that. That's crazy. By the way, in regards to meet and greets, what do you consider? Well, what would be like the coolest gift you've seen somebody give the band? And then what is on the spectrum of just don't fucking bring it, people? Um, there's some people that have done like really thoughtful things. I can't think of something like off off the top of my head you know but like um i forget what her name was but she there was a girl that did like um i think it was a hand carved wooden sign that said jack's tree house which is the name of tom's cabin and idle wild and that was oh, just cool. something that like there was just something that she took the time to realize something that's important to him and like would fit with the motif you know what i mean like things like that are really cool I've seen a ton of really bad portraits, like hand-drawn portraits of band guys. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, like plenty of people bring Swedish fish for Tom, which is still weird. Like, uh. that's, like I try not to eat sugar. I go out on tour and all of a sudden there's fucking bags of Swedish fish around. Oh my and gosh. Like, okay, we got to stop this. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's just like... It's it's just anything that's thoughtful, you know what I mean? Anything that like dives deep dives to something that's like open knowledge, you know, you don't want anything that's like like how did this person find out about this? Um yeah. but but there's a lot of cool shit like that that kids have done that's like that's really rad. Yeah. There's I've one seen some... uh, go ahead. There's these two these two girls that came to a lot of the meet and greets on the last tour, and I wish I don't know who their names or um but they brought like when tom got sick they brought this massive bag of oh. like cold remedy stuff you oh, know gosh. Yeah. Uh, and it was great it was like it was phenomenal and actually sits in my production case that i bring with me everywhere like all of that stuff is made it in there like like throat coat teas like um sudafed like all sorts of stuff it was like it was very like it was to, extremely nice of them to bring it you know yeah like, i could have had a runner runner go pick up all that stuff but it was like literally the first day they heard he was sick they brought all this stuff and so um that was really cool of them uh and thoughtful you know what i mean yeah like, he, he, i remember him looking at it and be like oh shit i need like all of this stuff <laughs> yeah yeah and, and nobody has to go to walgreens real quick so yeah no that is cool to go to walgreens yeah, when I met Tom at the meet and greet last in 2019, I brought him and David original boxcar racer stickers from like 2002, which I thought was cool. Oh, yeah. But but what's funny is every time I do a meet and greet or like, you know, meet people or whatever, if I give them something or show them like a tattoo or something, I'm always as soon as I get done, I'm like, that was so fucking Why stupid. I do that? That's yeah. going straight <laughs> in the trash after this. They don't yeah, give a fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, totally. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, but I think that it doesn't go in the trash. I can tell you, you know, it's so, there's like, uh, I've been cleaning out one of the stories. So we're like, I'm getting ready to actually organize an inventory. I've been taking inventory, but organizing another, like a bunch of the gear that we no longer use, you know, yeah. like putting everything together. We're probably going to do some sort of online sale. Um, for people that live locally, I'll probably just have it like opened up for a day for like four hours where I'll be, uh, where we keep all of our gear. Um, and like, you know, if something, if you want, if you see something that you want, like, you know, like you can come get it that day. Oh, um, nice. The rest. Yeah. Yeah. The rest will probably, I think we're probably going to list it on like reverb.com and then yeah. like, people can, and then we can ship it out to you. But um, whenever I do that stuff, it's always like this crazy um, like trip down memory lane, you know? 
uh, like I just found a bunch of like original blink stickers from um, oh, the shit. Dude Ranch era. You know, uh, I, think they are, I think they're actually like Dude Ranch. I'll, I'll send you some. Okay. Like, shoot me your address. I'll, I'll send you some stuff. I'll say I'll there. buy them. <laughs> no, <laughs> but um, they, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, like we, Tom's assistant once called me and was like, "Hey, can you meet me at this like storage unit off this like?" I was like, sure, for what? She was like, apparently Tom has a storage unit there like that no one knows about. Like, oh my. He didn't even know about. It. it was like it was it was being billed through his business manager and then they switched people and so they were like, Yeah, what what is this? So we went over there and opened it up and literally like original blank backdrop, original like Tom's original cab. Like that's like it was a little, small little like uh fender cab. Um like old bass amp with like the old old Blink logo. It didn't. It just said Blink and had a rabbit. It didn't even say Blink One Eighty Two. There's yeah. like uh, wow. like that stuff there. And then found those stickers. I found the boxcar backdrop. You know, I I saw it's like our, some of your stuff in your Instagram story. Which by the way, for the listeners, he's at x humblebrag x. If you want to give him a follow. Yeah. But dude, in your Instagram stories, it's like, what did I find today? Oh, the fucking yeah. boxcar <laughs> racer guitar. No big deal. <laughs> like. You found some crazy yeah. shit in the past couple months. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy shit. Um, it's just that, you know, we <clears throat> when we when we moved out of the old studio, everything went into storage unit and then um into storage units. Now we have like a crazier situation with being able to keep gear in a in like in another spot. And so um just organizing all that stuff and like kind of remembering, you know, when we did the like I think what some people refer to as the legacy sale a couple of years ago, where he sold off a bunch of guitars and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I organized that, but then went on tour. And so um, his, the people at like, I, I think it was still RLP and then to the stars basically handled all the, the shipping of that stuff. And like, I didn't really know, like, I don't, didn't know what sold and what came back and what was still <laughs> around. Yeah. So when we had to move, it was kind of in a hurry. And so I literally, I was just like, I had a, like a couple trucks there and we were just loading things up, taking it to the storage unit, dumping it into the storage unit. And so over time, I've gone back and gone through and started and been like, okay, well, we still have this or we still have that or I guess that sold, you know? Yeah. Um, so it was just like, uh, you know, kind of like stuff like that where you're like, I th thought we still had this, but I guess not. Um, yeah. And then... It's cool stuff. And then there's other things that are hidden in cases that shouldn't be in that case. <laughs>